Okay. So can you can you see and hear me? Yes. Yeah. You also? Okay. It's fine. So uh, welcome to this uh, uh, first lecture of Robotics 2. As I already anticipated to your colleagues, uh, we will uh, ex experiment uh, a different way of teaching this course this year. Uh, sorry. Here. So uh, we start today and we will end up at the end of May. This course is intended for uh, the two uh, courses of study, the Masters in Artificial Intelligence and Robotic as well as in Control Engineering. Uh, there are six credits for this course and uh, you may know that one uh, European credit uh, is equivalent to 24 25 hours of student work, so six credits means 150 hours of your work, okay? So this will be uh, organized in this way for uh, this year. So first of all, uh, you may have seen that the whole uh, course of last year uh, has been recorded and is available on the YouTube channel of the department. Uh, this link in your PDF should be uh, clickable, so you should connect to the site and in particular to the Robotics 2 playlist. There are about uh, 20, uh, 20 uh, individual videos or so uh, for a total of about 50 hours of video lectures. And this cover the whole material of the course. So uh, including those parts which are not fully detailed in the text. Okay, so this is exactly one-to-one -one with the program. And uh, I, last year, I made a special effort in updating materials, so videos, and so on. So this is uh, uh, the state of the art in, in, in teaching robotics, too, at least for what is, uh, refers to me. So uh, I'm expecting that you will look at this video at the pace which is uh, related to what we will do in the classroom. So this is something that you can do either uh, during the class hours and or uh, before uh, when, uh, when we will do some uh, explicit class hours. So uh, indeed I cannot ask you to do uh, 50 hours of lectures at home, let's say, plus 50 or 60 hours in the classroom or via Zoom because this would be too much for you. So I'm expecting uh, about 30 hours uh, in the classroom or on Zoom, which will follow the material that you have already studied at home. And uh, this lecture will be devoted to these things that you see on the, on, the, on the slide. So question and answer on the material that you have just uh, studied, uh, doubt, whatever, feel free really to uh, uh, Put whatever question you have, so don't don't be shy because this is exactly what we are supposed to do together. Okay, uh, and I will do also some exercise. Okay, so some exercise, mostly on the blackboard. I will use some MATLAB program sometimes, so I will have to switch. But I will try to do this exercise on the blackboard, so uh, in the same way that you do in the exam. Okay, and of course further discussion. Uh, uh, deepening of some subject, I can point out to some material if you request and so on. And in the uh, classroom, uh, remote or not, hours, we will or also organize a, a midterm test, mainly after the first two blocks of material, which is advanced kinematics and dynamic modeling of robot manipulators. Okay. Uh, what is left? up to 150 hours, about 70 hours of your individual study, okay? So I, I stop here, and if you have any question on this organization, please let me know. And we will come back to the midterm test later on. At home? Yes, no yes, uh, very clear. Yes? Uh, everything is clear. Everything is clear, okay, good. So, uh, 
So the lecture schedule then is, of course, Monday and Wednesday. So today uh, with a bad start, but Wednesday, uh, we hope everything will be better. So in this week, I will, be, uh, I will do a regular introduction to the course, which is the first block of slide that I uploaded yesterday night, uh, and uh, which is already uh, there in the, the setting. This is, uh, so of course, I invite you to, this morning we have uh, nine uh, seats reserved, uh, six of them came plus one, so we have seven, seven, eight, somebody joined later? No, you, you joined later, but uh, where are you registered? What is your name? Okay. So we have uh, eight of your colleagues here in the classroom. Uh, and so I invite you, uh, there is much more space if things work out since I'm doing uh, in these hours uh, many things at the blackboard you may wish to be here of course the blackboard will be uh, viewed from the camera so we will have a different view if i show uh, slides or if i write something on the blackboard uh, so this will be uh, once a week more or less okay this depend the schedule is variable because uh, we will see from the beginning if you're able to catch up with the material because of course, if you don't look at the materials, if not completely study the material and collect doubts and questions, uh, this session is almost useless. Okay, it's a, just a silent part. Okay, so but more or less once a week. So we will have a total of 30 hours at the end. Now, uh, if you're not do, done this yet, but I think that by now, uh, I've seen many further requests that I will process this morning at the end of the lecture. So please register to the Google group with your uh, account. Let's see if there is some, sorry. There are more questions. Uh, okay, so. Uh, there are more questions that I will now uh, say to you. I, I don't know if you're, if you're, are you seeing the chat list on the screen? No, okay, so I, I don't know if this is recorded either, but anyway, there are a uh, few questions from home. Uh, are these lectures going to be recorded? Uh, yes, huh? yes, but uh, as I, do, I have done for Robotics One, uh, I will keep this recording for a while. I, it's not clear if I'm going to publish them. So please attend the lecture. There are a few lectures to attend uh, at fixed time. So please try to be here or remotely via Zoom. Uh, of course, will you tell us time by time which video we have to see? Naturally, I will see, be very clear. So this, segment of video with the link, uh, the material on the slide that is attached, but already in the material page of the uh, website of the course, of Robotics 2, you will see a, a very detailed description of what goes with what, okay? So, uh, but I will repeat it from time to time. The problem is with the matriculas, we can reserve all the session. Of course, uh, you cannot reserve all the session, but you alternate uh, week by week, I guess. Okay, so in one week, there's a 50% of you that can uh, register and attend in the classroom. Uh, this would make about 60 people. The classroom has a maximum COVID uh, capacity of 48 seats. I don't think we will get ever to 48 people in, in the classroom, which is okay, but uh, I think that all that like to come uh, with this restriction can come. So uh, this was uh, for the chat. So the G group, as I said, uh, you are already registered. This will uh, be open still for a while. But uh, the main message is of, I, I will communicate like in Robotics One only through the Google group. 
except for special individual cases. Uh, but uh, I would hope, uh, I hope really that you will use the, the, the group also for posting your questions. Uh, I received many questions on my personal email, which I replied indeed. A few times I asked before replying to reformulate the question for the, in the Google group because there's no, I mean, there's no particular reason for being shy of whatever doubt one has. Uh, we are here exactly for this reason. Uh, so that everybody can uh, take advantage of the, of the uh, reply, okay, so that I don't repeat the same thing many times which happened in the past, okay? So, uh, again, uh, move here, okay. So what are the prerequisites of this course? Although this is not written explicitly in any document, oh, in any document, sorry. Here. Okay, uh, robotics one is a prerequisite. In which sense? Uh, you are not, uh, so you can follow the course uh, even without having given robotics one, uh, although uh, you may have followed the lectures. Uh, when you um, book an exam, the, the exam of robotics two, then uh, when the exam occurs, you should have robotics one already registered in InfoStream. okay? So even if, uh, say, in one session there is a robotics one in the morning, robotics two in the afternoon, and you do the robotics one in the morning, but your uh, paperwork has not been yet corrected, so you haven't received a, a grade, so you cannot attend the robotics two session. Okay. So um, why is that? Because uh, many robotics one is a basic course. No? It, it, the basics should not be forgotten when you move on, okay? So if you're not firm on this, it's very hard to continue. And we will see it right at the beginning with the first few topics. So what are the aims, what is the goal of this robotics course, which can be called an advanced robotics? Again, uh, the robotics one course is almost equal everywhere in the world because you have to learn kinematics, you have to go learn trajectory planning, uh, a few concepts of uh, motion control, uh, sensors, actuators, and so on, okay? Uh, robotics too, because robotics is a multidisciplinary topic, uh, it's very different depending on university, nations, and so on, on the background of your teacher. Uh, you have uh, advanced courses for mechanical engineer, for computer science engineer, for control engineer, uh, for bioengineers, and so on, and so on. So every course has its own uh, specialties. So what we will do here is um, some topic of advanced kinematics, essentially calibration of robots and use of redundancy. We will go back to this. And then uh, all sort of uh, dynamic analysis. So how to derive the dynamic model of the robot manipulators and uh, how to use it, how to identify the dynamic parameters and coefficients that are inside the model, and what is the use of the uh, dynamic model. And then we will move to, so the, the uh, midterm test will stop here, okay? Uh, the second part is design of feedback control law based on sensor information, proprioceptive or exteroceptive. And both for the task of free motion and interaction with the environment. Okay, this is a very uh, important topic. Both of them are very important in industrial application and in service application. So the textbook is this one. Uh, you see it there. So also here. Okay, uh, it covers uh, both robotics one, robotic two, and also part of autonomous and mobile robotics of Professor Oriolo. Uh, there are some missing parts, and in particular the part on uh, uh, use of redundancy is very small in this version, but you have plenty of material in the slides. Of course, the textbook is our main reference. Uh, related courses, of course, uh, you have uh, the autonomous and mobile robotics, which is at the first semester of the second year, so not in this semester. Uh, and as the name says, uh, this will handle, will 
everything concerning uh, mobile bases. Okay, so legged robots, uh, wheeled robots, motion planning among obstacles and things like that. Okay, while we are restricted to a different category of robots. Uh, the elective in robotics or control problems in robotics, which is essentially a, a collection of four uh, individual module that you can take one independent of the other. If you have elective in robotics for the AI and robotics uh, students, you have 12 credits, you have to take all four modules. Uh, if you have control problems in robotics, which is for control engineers, or for students in AI and robotics that have elective in AI and would like to take some topics from uh, the other elective, so uh, there are two, you can pick up two modules out of four. And then there is also medical robotics in this semester by Professor Venditelli. And if you're interested in that type of very relevant application nowadays of uh, robots in the medical domain, uh, surgery, and uh, minimally invasive uh, activities with the human body, then uh, this is a, a nice course as well. So uh, the textbook is the, this one, uh, and it's an international one. So there's a Chinese version, there's a Greek version, there's an Italian version, of course, which is one-to-one -to, -one to this book. Now it starts to be a bit updated, and probably in the next couple of years there will be a, a new edition, but uh, for the time being, this is a, a bestseller worldwide. And uh, these are three colleagues from the University of Naples, uh, Bruno Siciliano is a very good friend of me. We started the uh, PhD course in Italy for the first time ever together. He in Naples, me in Rome. So we have also uh, published together some materials and some of the chapter, in fact, are coming from our common view. Uh, Giuseppe Oriolo is my colleague here uh, in Rome and he added the, the part on, on uh, mobile robotics. So this covers everything. It's worth having. I know, uh, by the way, I think that uh, some of these books during the first uh, lockdown, Springer made it open to everybody, including the Springer Headbook of Robotics. So I don't know if you, I, I distributed the message at the time. I don't know if you downloaded the PDF. Okay, so uh, now I'm, uh, this slide is, taking a slightly modified from the introduction of a, a workshop, international workshop on uh, 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 algorithms for robotics, uh, which is called BAF. Uh, and I find that this introduction was very nice uh, because, uh, uh, because it covers uh, many things. And it, of course, it, uh, the emphasis on algorithms. So what are these algorithms? You need algorithms for processing inputs coming from sensor. Remember, uh, our definition of robotics is the intelligent connection between perception and action. So perception is acquired through sensing. I mean, uh, data collected from sensor are not yet perception because need to be processed to understand what is inside. So uh, this is one, you, you need algorithms for doing this. And of course, uh, you have partial data, for instance, if you have a camera overlooking the scene, you may see only part of the object there, so you have a partial obstruction and you like to reconstruct what is in fact behind this partial uh, occlusion. Uh, you have noisy data coming from all types of sensor, proximity sensor, but also proprioceptive sensor may have noise, for instance, force sensor mounted on the end effector, or even tachometer if you're using explicitly uh, velocity sensor at the joints, they are typically noisy. So you need algorithms for doing this. And similarly, you need algorithms for building models. Building models, we have seen uh, how to build kinematic model of our robot manipulators. So using geometry and using uh, differential equation uh, to uh, relate the motion of the joints with the motion of the end effector and vice versa, or the position of the joints with the position and orientation of the end effector and vice versa, and all uh, type of things. So mostly geometric and kinematics. Uh, in this second course, we will go more physical because we will look at the cause 
that produce motion. So what are the forces and torques that will move the rock? We know already that uh, there are actuators uh, driving uh, the joints of the motors through transmission element, transmission and reduction elements, and typically electrical motors produce torques. So the input to the robot system are torques, while uh, for all the course of robotics one, we have dealt only with kinematic command uh, and kinematic control. So either specifying joint velocity or joint acceleration, things like that. Okay. So because we, uh, if you remember, uh, we were supposed, uh, supposing that at the level of the joints, there are low level direct control loops that receive these commands of the kinematic type and make sure that they are converted in torque commands that will drive uh, the motion according to the desired project. Okay. And if we are not demanding too much, this type of control works. Demanding too much means uh, not too fast trajectory, uh, limited acceleration, and so on. If we push to the limits our performance, even we inside the capability of our actuators, then something strange happened, and I've done a simulation of that, if you remember. So uh, you detach from the actual uh, motion. So something is, uh, the low level controller is not able to catch up with this command and cannot be seen any longer as an ideal controller. So replicating whatever velocity you're asking to the joints. Okay, so uh, the physical model with dynamics will include, in fact, the dynamics of the robot. The fact that uh, moving a robot which has the same geometry but is 10 times heavier uh, will require more torque, okay, which is masked with the other approach. And we'll see a, a number of examples where dynamics is relevant. Now, uh, of course, algorithms, and, and of course, algorithms for obtaining the dynamic model and for using the dynamic model. Uh, algorithms are needed also for plan high level or low level action, of course, at the level of motion planning and trajectory planning uh, with a limited time is horizon, so very fast and online, or assuming that you know in advance uh, all the situation and have uh, enough computing power and time for computing a, a global solution. And in that case, your algorithm may be complete or not. Complete in the sense that it gives you a solution if a solution exists or returns a no solution exists answer. This is the completeness which is often required, which is very hard to uh, obtain if the environment is dynamically changing, if something is unknown. Of course, completeness is very hard to obtain. There's another form of completeness, which is called uh, probabilistic completeness, which says that in the long run, uh, your algorithm, which is based on some probabilistic reasoning, will obtain a solution if this exists with probability one, which is not certainty, but it's very likely to be so if you give enough time to the algorithm to work. Okay, so algorithms are everywhere. And of course, the need of executing uh, uh, with actuators that are, have limited capability, uh, sometimes limited accuracy because of the sensor, but also because of the way in which they work. For instance, step motors uh, have increment only of a finite amount of angular uh, values. Uh, so what happens in, in, the, in the long run? Uh, so how this uh, use the actuators and certainly you, um, in, a, in a global sense, you face the uncertainty by using feedback, uh, by correcting your action with feedback. And this will be uh, fundamental in, uh, already in Robotics 1, but in this course uh, as well. So uh, when you design and analyze and check the property of uh, robot algorithms, uh, then you, need, you may need uh, to use multiple sources of uh, knowledge and information, so from many fields. And, here is a list of fields which is involved in any of these algorithms and some of these algorithms. Uh, control theory, computational geometry and topology. Remember that we uh, simply said that the configuration space of a manipulator is some 
space, some Euclidean space in Rn, if n is the number of joints. But this is not true because we have, uh, I remember well, we have done some example for our good old friends, the planner to our robot arm. And we said if we uh, uh, write, if we draw uh, in the plane uh, a square with uh, minus pi plus pi for the first joint, minus pi plus pi for the fourth second joint. So we have a square and every point represents a configuration. But then the vicinity between configuration is lost in this representation because in fact, the actual configuration space is a torus where you have the metric uh, of vicinity. So there are computational and topology consideration, geometry and topology consideration which are important. Of course, geometrical and physical modeling, as we said, reasoning about uh, uncertainty, you have a course probabilistic robotics, which is essentially devoted to that. Uh, probability of uh, a priori, how it is changed to a, a posteriori probability once you collect data from the environment. Uh, there is also a course uh, filtering and optimal control for the students of quantum engineering, where probability plays a, a basic role. Um, Again, probabilistic algorithm and game theory, uh, when you have multi-agent system, uh, sometimes you can formulate the problem of controlling their motion as a uh, game theoretical, uh, in a game theoretical framework. And of course, many things from computer science, including uh, from theoretical computer science, including uh, complexity uh, of algorithms, if they are uh, feasible to be implemented in real time or not. Now, my course uh, will develop mainly uh, on the field of control theory for the whole second part. So, how we command with feed forward and feedback command the robot in such a way that we achieve our task. And of course, geometrical and physical modeling uh, concerning the dynamic models of robots. Uh, any question on this? I, I've seen... Uh, uh, a couple of chats. Okay, Riccardo Righetti says, I saw on your site, we cannot do the robotics 2 exam. If, uh, exactly. Can we still do the midterm of robotics 2? Yes, yes, okay. You can do still the midterm huh? because the midterm is something internal. Okay, it's part of the course. It's the exam that puts the limit. Okay, so for instance, if you have a, a, a good uh, grade in the midterm of robotics 2 and you would like to complete the exam with a written exam on the remaining part uh, and this and at that time you have not yet registered robotics 1 then you cannot do it first you have to do the robotics 1 and then complete the exam of robotics 2 but the midterm can be done in any case uh, uh, okay, uh, somebody has lost. Uh, well, I, I cannot repeat this. Uh, I can, I can, Francesca Giannone, I can write you a short note uh, separately. Okay, so, uh, so the program. First of all, uh, sorry for looking there. Uh, first of all, uh, what is the characteristic? Like in Robotics 1, we made a clear, a sharp separation between mobile base and fixed base. So we will deal with fixed base manipulators. Nonetheless, uh, the dynamic modeling technique that we will develop can be applied also to mobile robots. Okay, where in fact the emphasis is not so much on, on dynamics but more on kinematics. Okay. So uh, the first set will be advanced kinematics. As I, as I said, there are two main topics. One is quite short, is kinematic calibration. What is kinematic calibration? Essentially, uh, the fact that uh, the manufacturer uh, sends you a robot with some nominal geometric parameter. In fact, some nominal Dana Vitartung parameter. When it shows the workspace uh, drawing with uh, dimension of uh, links and so on, these are all nominal dimensions. And there could be some error in manufacturing, in assembling, and so on. Very small error, in fact. Uh, same story for the twisting of the axis. 
and also for the mounting of the encoders of the joint. Uh, no matter if you have an absolute or incremental encoder, you know that the absolute encoder has a zero in some configuration. The incremental encoder has a third track that resets the counter at a certain configuration. And of course, if you mount a little bit rotated the encoder on the model side, then you have a, a permanent offset. Okay, as you have a permanent offset on the parameter alpha a and d of the Navier-Tartner, so also on the measurement of theta, if we are assuming that we have a relative joint, which is most of the case. Okay, so how do you recover this? Re remember that serial manipulator, especially uh, if you have small errors along the chain, of course, at the end of factor level, which is what matters in terms of accuracy, uh, this will be uh, become possibly too large for the accuracy required by this manipulator. Okay, so calibration means doing extra experiment uh, with a calibrated external sensor, otherwise uh, you would only do a mess. Uh, and then realizing that what you compute through the nominal kinematics and what you measure through the actual measurement is different. And how do you use this difference to update slightly, right? because there's not large changes, to update in an iterative fashion your nominal parameters until you have calibrated the robot. The calibration process is something which is ubiquitous for any uh, sensing device. And in this sense, sorry for the, uh, so in, in, in the same way, let's say, the robot manipulator is seen as a measuring device. So moving the joints in order to place in a specific point in the workspace the end effect. And as such needs to be calibrated as well. So kinematic calibration is a prerequisite for any manipulator. You can do it once when you install the robot, you can repeat the calibration from time to time because of wear and tear and so on. Okay, and we will see this. Uh, it's a topic which I use uh, to start with because it refreshes something about the Navitartender parameter, uh, if you've forgotten that. Uh, they are not, should not be forgotten. And then we will move to kinematic redundancy uh, and all the related uh, uses and control methods. Uh, we have already seen in Robotics 1 uh, the concept of redundancy and few uh, related uh, items. So we have redundancy every time the robot has more degrees of freedom than the dimension of the task that it's required to do. So for instance, if we have a planar 3R robot with three joints, so we can move the end effector in the plane and also orient the end effector in the plane. Uh, but if we only focus on position the end effector or moving the end effector in position along the trajectory. So the task is two dimensional, but we have three joints. So we have one degree of redundancy. What do we do with this extra degrees of redundancy? Uh, we have just mentioned things that can be done. Uh, for instance, uh, being inside, to keep the robot inside the joint ranges or avoid obstacles or maximize the manipulability of the end effector uh, and so on, or optimize motion time in a rest to rest maneuver and so on and so on. So we will see here how to use redundancy and uh, so why to use redundancy and how to use it and all the methods that are formal methods uh, that exploit redundancy in order to optimize some criteria and satisfy additional constraints. Okay, this will be a very heavy topic. So uh, talking about future lecture, of course, the first requirement that I will ask you, and I will send this uh, in the Google group, will be uh, study the kinematic calibration. This is our one hour and 10 minutes lecture. So this will not complete a full part. So maybe we can, uh, we will add for the next week, uh, we will add a uh, first part of introductory part on kinematic redundancy in order to make, let's say, a three hours package of, uh, of uh, video lecture. Uh, then we will move to dynamic modeling. Okay, dynamic modeling of manipulators. 
uh, we will see what is the difference between direct and inverse dynamics. Pay attention. This has nothing to do with direct and inverse kinematics, although the parallel is uh, suggesting you know, this. Uh, in fact, direct dynamics is uh, computing or uh, obtaining the motion from the application of some input with the actuator. So you produce torques with the actuators, the robot moves, how will it move? So this is the answer. Okay. And of course, either you do this on the robot itself, or you have a, a dynamic model of the robot, and so you can simulate the robot. And the simulation is, in fact, the integration of nonlinear differential equation that you can do with software available, with Simulink, for instance, with Gazebo, to use. Uh, and it's, in fact, solving the direct dynamic problem. So it uses the dynamic model. The inverse dynamics in, is, in fact, the reverse. If I would like to have some specific motion of the end effector or of the joints, let's say of the joint, what is the input torque that I have to apply in order to reproduce this? And you still use the same dynamic model, but you use it in the reverse way. And in fact, you don't need to integrate any differential equation. You just do an algebraic computation, which can be, should be made very fast. In fact, you can do it at every sampling time and you can speed up the sampling time if you need this information for commanding the robot in a, uh, in a fast way. So there are, there, it's very important to obtain here efficient algorithms for solving the inverse dynamics. Indeed, uh, even a simulation should not last forever. If you're simulating a 45 degree robot with its inertia, masses, gravity, Coriolis, and centrifugal effect, you may take a while. But in fact, the simulation runs offline. So you're not particularly interested in making efficient this, although you're still interested. But when you're computing uh, the actual command associated to a motion and you want to apply this in real time, then efficiency is matters. And this is a problem of inverse dynamics. OK? Now, how do you derive the model? There are many ways, huh? many ways. Uh, mechanical engineer has developed many alternative ways, and they pre everybody prefers his own method. The Keynes method, uh, Hamilton principle, Lagrange equation, Euler equation, Newton Euler, and so on and so on. And we will only consider two which have their own uh, advantage. So the Euler-Lagrange formulation, which is an energy-based formulation. It's very interesting because if you add additional phenomena, you can add energy and then not uh, lose whatever you have computed so far. So you compute the kinetic energy of the system, the potential energy of the system, mainly due to gravity, but sometimes you have also the formable object in the chain, for instance, the transmission, if you're using harmonic drives, you have uh, elasticity at the joints, and uh, to elastic with the elasticity, with the deformation of the, of the transmission, you associate the potential energy as well. Uh, so you put everything together, you build the Lagrangian function, which is the difference between kinetic energy and potential energy, not the sum, which is the total energy of the system. And then you apply some optimality condition, which generate the equation of motion. And the nice thing is that you can do this purely symbolically. So you don't have to put numbers. No? You, you just have to define quantities, the inertia of the links, the mass of the links, the position of the center of mass of the links, and how the links are related through the kinematic transformation of Denavit-Hartenberg. You put everything inside and you obtain a huge model, no? but all in symbolic terms. Of course, at this point, if you want to use the model, you have to put numbers inside. Okay. Uh, but uh, the fact that the model has some structure is very helpful because this general structure, not of the specific robot, I mean, the specific robot has some numbers inside, but the whole structure has some properties that are useful for proving uh, the behavior of certain control law, for showing that no matter which robot you're considering, if you're applying, for instance, a PD control law at the joint, and there is no gravity involved, then you will uh, stabilize any desired configuration that you may have. This is a very strong 
result, which is interesting per se, but it's also the basic for many other further results which do better than that. Okay, so that specify the transient and the accuracy, uh, satisfy uh, trajectory following and not only regulation to a specific configuration and so on. On the other side, you have Newton-Euler formulation, which is essentially the multi-body version of F equal M times A, force equal mass times acceleration for a single mass. Okay, uh, now we have multiple link. Each link has its own mass and inertia, and it's interconnected to the previous link and to the following one. So they exchange forces while moving. Uh, but essentially you can write a balance of forces and torques so for linear motion and angular motion for every link. And this becomes a huge mess if you do it symbolically. But the nice thing is that you can organize uh, for a serial manipulator arm, like uh, we are studying, you can organize a, 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 a forward iteration for computing all uh, needed kinematic quantities, so linear velocity, angular velocities of the bodies, and then uh, a reverse uh, iteration where you're moving from one link from the end effect to the base and you're computing the associated torque. So uh, for inverse dynamics, uh, for an efficient version of inverse dynamics, we will use Newton Euler in a numerical way. And in fact, one can show that uh, the numerical version of Newton Euler for computing the inverse dynamics of a robot, so computing uh, the torque needed for doing some desired motion uh, grows linearly with the number of joints. So it's the best possible argument that you can think of. Of course, it will take more time for a 45 degrees robot than for a 3 degree of freedom robot. And of course, uh, the properties of the dynamic model are very important, the general properties, and also the identification of the dynamic parameters that uh, are inside the model. And not all the parameters of a single link will appear in the complete model because some of these inertias or uh, position of uh, center of mass will not be involved in the actual mobility of the robot. And we will see that there's a big difference between the parameters of each link and the global coefficients that appear in the dynamic model of the entire robot. And then there are some extra feature like uh, presence of flexibility at the joint. This is very important, especially nowadays that robots become lightweight and are supposed to interact or to move in the presence of humans, then some form of compliance should be present and controlled. And in fact, the most common one is uh, having explicitly compliance in the joints and having lightweight but stiff links. And of course, other situation where the end effector or some part of the, of the structure is geometrically constrained. How does the dynamics changes when we are constraining part of the degrees of freedom in a arbitrary way? Okay, so all this will be treated in the dynamic model part. Now, uh, here I should stop and do something on the blackboard, but this is impossible uh, today, so I will defer this to the next lecture huh? so that I can start with uh, but essentially ask yourself why and when do we need dynamics for robot control uh, we have already I already said something uh, we, when we are not requesting uh, too fast motion or too, too large acceleration then uh, we can go along with uh, kinematic control assuming that the low level control loops works fine but there are other situations where we need dynamics and of course we need dynamics in control in fact uh, the second part of the course so so think about this and i, I will show you some simple example you know, where dynamics makes a difference so uh, the second part i said is uh, feedback control laws and as i added this uh, extra sentence torque input commands so we will assume that we have to command torques not joint velocities or joint acceleration not the kinematic quantity so we would like that our actuators deliver torque 
based on all the information coming from extraceptive or proprioceptive sensing. In the most simple case, when the robot is in free motion and does not interact with anything else, just do uh, some pick and place of operation or move a camera around and so on, uh, then we will use only the proprioceptive sensor. So we will assume that we have a measurement of Q and a direct or indirect measurement of Q dot. Now, if we have very accurate uh, high resolution encoders, then we can extract the Q dot from uh, two successive measurements of Q. And we have seen this already uh, in the Robotics 1 course. But no matter, this uh, acquires the state of the robot and computes something which is the torque that the robot should apply with its actuators. Okay, so that should be applied to the robot with the actuators. Uh, sometimes you have a proxy of the torque, so you can command current, but we know that uh, for most uh, used uh, electrical actuators, the producer torques is proportional to the current, so you have just to include a, a gain between current and torque, and you may have some torque feedback loop or current feedback loop that enforces the command that you're uh, applying to the actuators. So in a sense, uh, you can imagine that your robot is torque controlled in the sense that you can really write a code that outputs a value of torque and this will be sent to the uh, controller of the actuators and the actuators will deliver that torque. Okay. And you can imagine that if you do a motion, the same motion for a very light robot or for a very heavy robot with the same geometry uh, things, then of course in the, uh, in the heavier case you will need more torques for moving things. You have to contrast gravity, otherwise the robot would fall, and all these things that makes dynamics important. So our feedback control load almost in all cases there is one exception in this course will be of the dynamic type so we'll generate torque outputs. Now what are the tasks that we require for a robot? Uh, free motion task as I said so there's no interaction with the environment uh, and we can have two type of free motion tasks. The first type is set point regulation or regulation as such which means that the robot starts somewhere typically at rest and should go as fast as possible uh, or without oscillation, without overshooting to a final destination, either in the joint space or in the Cartesian space. And depending on how you build the error, you may have Cartesian torque controller or joint space torque controller. You always command torque at the joint level, but as we have seen already in Robotics 1 when dealing with kinematic control, the difference is where you build the error, in which space you uh, build the error. So set point regulation can be solved in different ways. For instance, if you want to do a pick and place operation, you don't care what is the path that you're following or going from the initial to the final destination. Okay? You just care about going there. So for solving set point regulation, there are simpler control laws because you're not requesting really to follow trajectories. Uh, and this is listed here, PD with gravity cancellation or compensation, if gravity is present. Cancellation is different from compensation. Cancellation means removing from the picture the presence of gravity through control. We cannot imagine that our robot works uh, in the far space where gravity is negligible. So we have to cancel gravity or to compensate it just at the destination, you know, which is a simpler speed. Uh, or we can use an integral action. PD stands for proportional to the error and to the derivative of the error. If the error is a position, the derivative of the error is a velocity error. So PD means proportional to the position and velocity error that the robot is having. If we have a regulation task, the desired ve final velocity is zero because we have to stay there, okay? So uh, the PD is simply a proportional to the position error, and then uh, there's an additional term which is proportional to the actual velocity, which should be brought to zero. 
so uh, PID instead includes an integral action. This integral action may also be saturated for reason that we will see later on, but the integral action essentially tries to compensate, uh, to eliminate some steady state error that we would have otherwise. Okay, and I will uh, make some examples. And of course, uh, the matter here is gravity is the most typical, difficult things to do. So we model gravity and we can compensate or cancel gravity once we have modeled. But if it's too difficult to model gravity, we could also learn the actual uh, torque that compensates gravity uh, in an iterative way while we're moving toward the destination. And so this is a simple form of iterative learning. The other type of task for robots in free motion are trajectory tracking tasks. So in this case, we have to follow a trajectory in the Cartesian space or in the joint space. The trajectory may be decomposed in its geometric part, so it's a path and it's a timing law on the path. But many times here, we uh, join together the two things. At the level of planning, you typically separate because you would like to make the same, the same motion uh, faster or slower, so you change the timing, but you don't want to change the geometric part. But no matter what you have done at the planning stage, then you have a trajectory and you try to reproduce the trajectory, so both in space and time, okay? So for going to one point to the other, uh, you would like to follow a specific trajectory. So it's a more complex task, and there are many uh, controllers that you can apply requiring more or less information. Huh? So uh, we will see in particular, the best performing controller is the so-called feedback linearization controller, which in a single sentence is the following. You have a system which has a nonlinear dynamics. So things that you have not studied so far in the basic course of automatic control. It's not x dot equal ax plus u, which is a linear dynamics, but it's a fully nonlinear one. And it cannot be linearized around a specific point because uh, the linearization would change drastically by a factor of 100, depending on the configuration of the arm around which you linearizing the system. So you have to deal with nonlinearity. But you can design a nonlinear controller. In fact, a nonlinear controller that cancels, in the nominal case, all nonlinearities so that the robot, the nonlinear robot plus the nonlinear feedback controller is equivalent, exactly equivalent to a linear and decoupled system. That you can, so a single input, single output system for every generalized coordinates, and you can control this very easily. Okay? So th this is why, if you have a good model, this is the best performing controller ever. It cannot be beaten in terms of uh, reaction to uh, disturbances, uh, tracking uh, transient uh, error type, when you have a disturbance moving out of the trajectory, how you recover the trajectory uh, in a exponentially fast and without overshooting and so on and so on. And there are other versions. Of course, the requirement of having a very good model may be unrealistic sometimes. So you may go adaptive. So you may design a controller that while trying to track in the trajectory is also updating the information about the model. Okay. And you can do this in a robust way or not. And this is a new topic that I have added this year. Uh, we are doing some experiments right now. Uh, or you can go fully on online learning. Online learning means without iteration. So while you're doing the trajectory, you're updating some missing information from the model, but without giving a structure to it. So you start with your best available model, and what is missing in order to execute the, uh, the, the trajectory will be learned while, while moving. Okay? Indeed, if you have to repeat the motion, what you have learned is useful for the next iteration as well. But there's no need of doing iteration in this type of learning scheme. Now, the uh, other big uh, part of task is uh, interaction with the environment. And please consider inside the environment also a human. Because this is nowadays in Industry 4.0, in collaborative robotics, 
this is more and more a requirement. So robots not necessarily substituting the human worker, but working by side by side as a co-worker. Okay, so it, it becomes part of a very delicate, I would say, and very important environment. No? The human is there. So in interaction task, of course, uh, again we will model the type of interaction, and there are different ways of uh, designing controller that not only move the arm but also handle the exchange of forces once we are in contact. Typically, we are in contact with a tool mounted on the end effector, but in general, we may also have more uh, contact along the structure, especially if the robot is working side by side with me. So I, he, uh, myself or the robot may hit in any part of the structure. And we have, again, from simple to more Complete model, compliance and admittance control. Compliance essentially is uh, uh, you uh, generate a force which is proportional to some uh, displacement that you can make. Okay, and this displacement may be uh, in contact with a soft environment uh, or maybe in free space. So you react, generating uh, a force from a displacement. Admittance is the reverse. You feel a force and you react with a velocity, okay, with a displacement. So these are the basic uh, elementary. Then uh, impedance control is something more in the sense that when interacting, you would like to match some uh, mass spring damper model. So you would like that the interaction, you're not controlling in the interaction exactly the position or the force exchange, but you would like that uh, this displacement and forces follow a desired model. So you match a so-called impedance model, which in the simplest version can be seen as a mass spring damper system. So a second order system, and you can choose the parameter of the apparent mass, apparent stiffness of the spring, and apparent damping of the spring, uh, in such a way that you have nice transient and you keep limited the exchange of forces. Hybrid force velocity control instead uh, has this term, and hybrid stands for the fact that there are directions in space that will be controlled in motion, in velocity, and other direction where you control forces. So typically if you put your end effector uh, on the surface of a table, and the table is stiff enough, so you cannot enter in the table, so you cannot move inside the table, but in that direction you can control force. Whereas, if you assume that the table is perfectly a geometric surface without friction at all, uh, you can move freely on the surface. So there are two directions on the, on the surface of the table, in this simple case, where you can control motion. Of course, you command uh, torques at the joint level, so you cannot say, uh, I'm one joint, I'm controlling the normal force, and with the other two joints, I'm controlling the uh, velocity along the two direction on the plane. This is not the right way for doing, because everything mixes kinematically and dynamically. So you have to design errors in the task space and react to this, with all the joints together. But you separately control uh, forces, in this simple case, the normal force, and motion, in this case, the X and Y direction of movement, okay? So this is uh, the interaction task. Now, the last part of the program uh, is, uh, there's a one additional type of control law, which is a feedback control law, driven by a special external surface sensor, which is a vision camera. Uh, there's a question from home? No. Okay, so uh, in particular, we will see one, already force feedback can be considered as an exteroceptive uh, feedback from a sensor which interacts with the environment, not only inside the robot. But this is more classical. You have a camera mounted typically on board, so, uh, uh, eye in hand configuration, this is the way it's called, typically close to the end effector, which is uh, the image that you collect from this camera. It's a, it's a 
not a stereo camera in general, it's a monocular camera. It could be black and white, color, whatever. So you acquire an image. And in the image, you can extract some features. For instance, corners, lines, areas of figures, and so on. And you have recorded in advance, or have in memory, a desired location of this feature on the image plane. And you compare uh, where are these features now and where they should be, and this generates the error. And this, and only this error, will drive the motion of the eye. You see that it's very robust because, in fact, you don't need to know where is the object, how far it is. It's just everything is driven by the error on the image. So this is a so-called image-based visual servant. So you're commanding the motion of the robot by using this information. Because of the extra complexity that you have in this, I prefer to make a purely kinematic treatment. So we are assuming here and only here that uh, we are commanding Q dot, so velocity at the joint level. Okay, so assuming that there's a low level. Even because you, don't, you are not doing very fast motion when you're visual servant. Okay, so the assumption that you move reasonably slow uh, is there. And if it's not there, once you have understood how it works, the kinematic control based on visual information, you can always extend. And in the book, there's an extension also to the dynamic case. Okay. Uh, finally, there are uh, two subjects which I call uh, research oriented because we have done a lot of research also on other subjects that I will present, for instance, in image based visual servant. But these are uh, purely uh, research topics. One is what happens if one of your actuators or more of them have a failure, a partial failure? So you're requesting, uh, say, 20 Newton of torque. 20 newton meters of torque, and the, to and the actuator is delivering only 80 or uh, 10 or none at all. Can you detect this situation without having an explicit measure of the torque that is going? I mean, you're commanding a torque. You expect that what you're commanding is being executed, but in fact, it's not passing to the robot. Uh, another case is very simple. You don't know that there are some saturation limits, so you're requesting a high value of torque. But the motor cannot deliver more than that torque. So you're, in fact, the robot is uh, receiving less torque than you expect. So can you detect that, first point? Can you isolate which is the motor which has this problem? And can you identify the type of failure that this motor has? It's a saturation, is a power loss, is completely blocked. And you would like to do this in real time. Okay, so immediately so that you can take some emergency action. Either stop completely the robot or you know, activate if you have redundancy and you're using part of your joint only. You can switch from the uh, unactivate the failed joint or failed actuators and activate another one and still preserve completely the task. Okay, and so on and so on. The second uh, research topic is a valid art one. And in fact, you will see that I have devoted uh, uh, three or four video lectures to that, which is uh, handling with a physical human robot interaction. Physical because we expect also possible contact. Or we would like to avoid explicit contact. So we are not talking about cognitive interaction. So I'm speaking to the robot. The robot is, let's say, Pepper is replying to me, which is very important, especially in this pandemic. There was a uh, there are many applications for cognitive interaction between the user and, uh, and the robot, but this is not the main focus of my course. Uh, physical is what matters. And you have three levels of uh, possible interaction. You have to guarantee safety, uh, which means recognize if you're colliding with the robot. I mean, the robot should recognize if it's colliding with you or with anything in the environment. And in order to react to this in the proper way, so this is guaranteed safety. Uh, coexistence is what you typically uh, qualify as collaboration, but in fact, it's not yet the collaboration that I mean. Coexistence means working side by side. So uh, I'm here, the robot is in front, and we're sharing the same workshops, 
I'm doing my stuff, he's doing his stuff, or it is doing its stuff, and maybe we can exchange things, or uh, the robot can support a thing on which I can work, uh, and there are many things, but in fact, we never get in contact. Okay, so we coexist and we have to track the relative distance in order you know, the, the robot should you know, stop or retract if I'm getting too close, in uh, accidentally or not. Unless I explicitly say I want to collaborate, I can say it, I can uh, grab the robot fast and push it, I can push a button, whatever. Then when the collaboration starts, then the robot is interacting with me. So it's exchanging forces, but it should exchange forces in a controlled way. And this is the true collaboration. When you're holding a heavy table and you're carrying this table from one room to the other with a friend of yours, you're doing collaboration because you're exchanging forces. You adapt to what the other is doing and collectively reach a goal, okay? If you're holding an egg, and you're pressing too much, you will destroy the, the object. Okay, so forces matter, but also motion matters, and safety is always there. So we will see how this is organized. Uh, we have made several research results. Some of these research results uh, went into uh, commercial products. Uh, we have participated in the main uh, European project on this subject as well. And finally, uh, let me mention that we need simulation tools. As I said in the Robotics One course, every single concept, algorithm, method could be implemented in one uh, code. You can use MATLAB, but you can use Python, you can use C++, whatever. Okay. Uh, even more, this is true for Robotics Two in particular, because we would like to see things in motion and to control forces, trajectories, and so on. Uh, the simulation is very important, so simulating is also a friendly tool, but of course, we are not limiting this to that. You can use whatever other engine for simulating uh, the dynamics of the robot. And you can also use, make use of the robotics toolbox of Peter Kort, which uh, I just read few weeks ago that this is going to be dismissed as a support, but still available. I think that he's planning to do a version in Python of the same thing. But the um, MATLAB toolbox, robotics toolbox of Peter Ford, which is a friend and a professor uh, in Australia, is freely available to you. Okay. Uh, the other thing that you may wish to use is Coppelia Sim, which used to be named BREP which is more for animation, if you wish, no? for, for uh, showing in a realistic way uh, the motion of robots. Uh, and uh, the best way to use this, for me, is not to rely on the dynamic simulator of BREP, but to do your own simulation in, in MATLAB Simulink, and then output the outcome as an animation in, in uh, uh, Coppelia Sim, or I tend to use the old name Birep, so that you see a very nice picture because you have uh, already loaded many geometric models of uh, major robot arms. You can import data from your CAD model, what you can add things in the environment, uh, you can simulate sensors, you can do a, a lot of things uh, in this environment. But again, this is not mandatory per se. Uh, you can use Gazebo, uh, you can use uh, other uh, dynamic simulator and animator. Uh, we will not do a specific subject on this, I mean, unless I, I will convince one of our PhD students to make a special lecture on, on, on this. Uh, there are other important things concerning software. The most important one is ROS. Uh, are you familiar with ROS? So ROS is the so-called Robot Operative System, is an open source environment. In fact, it's a middleware. So it's a, a way of organizing larger robotics projects where you need to use several modules. Some you develop yourself, some you can take from the public library, uh, and you can exchange data in certain uh, 
format so that you can uh, construct your own uh, robotic application software uh, using multiple things that uh, are enabled to communicate in the right way. Of course, this is not the most efficient way of doing the project. I mean, if you really want to speed up things and make things fast and efficient, you have to write your own C++ code and everything is compacted there. You don't have a modular distributed approach like this. But uh, ROS is important, but this again is a computer science part. Uh, Professor Nardi used to deliver lecture on, on ROS. I think that, or uh, Luca Yocchi as well, I think that uh, they have something on the, on the web on this. And if not, uh, you go to the ROS website and you can learn whatever you wish. It's not so good. Okay. In the lab, we are using both ROS and C++. Okay, okay. I think that uh, I can, I will stop here because uh, the next would be a, a sneak preview of videos. So we will restart on Wednesday, again in class. I think that everybody, you will be uh, here as well. Uh, so I will start with something on the blackboard, namely what we have skipped uh, between, so motivating uh, the use of dynamics. And then we will go through uh, all these videos, which gives highlight on the following uh, parts. So remember that uh, in the next week, we will have only one class. And I will ask you, uh, I will write this explicitly, but uh, please cover certainly the calibration part, and I will tell you which part of the kinematic redundancy to call it. And then we may see, let's say, uh, one and a half hour on Friday, uh, sorry, on, on Wednesday of the next week. Okay? Any question on this? So, thank you for attending. Sorry for the part. I mean, I think that this work, there are some... Uh, Chat line. Okay, so Francesca Giannone, I should remember this. Uh, if we do the midterm of robotics two without having registered the robotic one SM, how long the midterm is back? Well, uh, independently of the fact that you have done or not done yet robotics one, the midterm is valid only for the first two sessions, so for June and July. Uh, Claudia Palak, I'm a change student. I came here for one semester. What should I do with the Robotics 1 exam? Uh, can I attend Robotics 2 without having done Robotics 1? Well, this depends on your background. Uh, since you're an Erasmus student, uh, if you have done some basic robotics course, you, should, uh, you can do Robotics 2. But uh, please send me an email uh, with your uh, background and I can reply to you. Uh, Alessia Carotenuto. Uh, the midterm can be done also by the second year student. No, the midterm is only intended for the students that are following for the first time Robotics 2 in this academic year. Is there an approximate date for the midterm? Well, as I said, after we have completed uh, the first two main subjects, so advanced kinematics and dynamics, uh, I, well, I cannot say, but this will be uh, around, I would say, beginning of April. Uh, but we will, uh, I, I will refine this date as, as we get along. What happens if the students pass the midterm with a good grade? There will be less material in the exam or it will be a project? Well, probably you, you missed the first part. So, uh, or I will come back at the end of the lecture on that. But essentially you can choose whether to do the remaining part as a written exam or to start the project uh, alone or in small group of up to three students. Okay, I think that's good. Bye bye. See you on Wednesday, and hopefully this will work.